around mid-March, all this stuff hit with the with COVID-19 and, pan, and the pandemic as far as closures go. So uh, I believe it was actually um, around March 15th or 16th that schools closed. I think if I remember correctly, that was around the last Sunday we met in person. The announcements came out on a Sunday. So it was the following Sunday that it was immediately determined we were not gonna meet uh, in person. A uh, lot, lot of discussion, a lot, lot of confusion at the time. There wasn't a lot known about COVID-19 or, or really what the pandemic was in general and what the, the outcome was gonna look like on the other side. Lots of discussions within uh, le church leadership, including uh, Patricia Parrish, um, Austin Lippert, uh, me as church council chair. And around early May or so, uh, we pulled together a reopening team, a reopening committee to start having discussions. One around protocols for anybody who would come into the church. One around what does this mean for worship in general? And then also to establish some protocols if and when we were able to open, uh, whether that be outdoor worship, whether that be indoor worship, whether that be small groups. What we did the first week was we did a live stream service because we were already doing live stream. So we did the live stream from the sanctuary. And the next day we met with what we later came to call our remote design team. We decided, well, we have to do something different. And so we determined at that point that we would start um, staging the worship service and filming it earlier in the week so that we could have the kind of images that we wanted to link together and put together. It was actually a new channel that we hadn't really explored uh, as, as a church. Um, just getting things out online and in social media as, as much as we did, uh, which has proven over the course of the last 14 months or so to be another channel by which we can reach people um, across not just the Midlands, but across multiple states. And we've been able to really do what we've been able to do because we've had this consistent group of people who've met every Monday at 10 o'clock to talk about the service we videoed this past week. How did it, how did it actually look when it all got put together? How, did, how can we improve it? How can we make sure that we're communicating the most effective way that we can the good news of Jesus Christ while we're in the middle of a pandemic and the ways in which we love one another? Pastoral care during the, um, the pandemic has been a very difficult challenge. It's been a challenge for us in terms of um, we couldn't safely go and be with people for, an, for a very long period. Um, and then there were very rigid restrictions on when you could or couldn't go in to see people. And it was particularly difficult for us, I think, when, when we, had, we knew that we had members in the hospital who were not going to survive but we couldn't go see them. Uh, well, the pandemic did change the way I do congregational care and nurture um, significantly uh, because a vital part of that ministry to me is face-to-face -face contact, which we had to cut out. I did use the telephone quite frequently. Um, I called, I believe everybody 65 and older throughout the first months of the pandemic to just check in and see how they were doing making sure that they could um, stay in touch with the church as much as they wanted to. Um, if they were unable to access the internet, which I found some people were that I wasn't aware of, uh, we added them to our mailing list where every week they get um, a Washington Street update with the prayer list and some prayers from Bishop Holston and any important news. They get the connection when it comes out. They get a printed worship God, and they get the sermon manuscript so that they could stay um, connected uh, because it's really bad to not be able to worship and not have the internet to fall back on. Uh, I also would, um, in, especially if people were having a really difficult time, would try to, if they were comfortable, meet them in public with masks on, outside, spaced, 
but again, to just have a little face-to-face -face contact um, because that's necessary. And I had to rely on my network of, of people to keep me abreast of what was going on uh, because I wasn't running into people at church and somebody says, oh, have you heard so-and-so is sick? Um, so thankfully, people who tend to be in the know stepped up and would send me emails or if I you know, talked to them, I would be like, have you heard anything about anybody that I should know? Um, because that's important and, and you don't get that when you don't run into people uh, on a weekly basis. Well, the soup seller presented a unique situation because in that space, we could have as many as 75 to 85 people at one time sitting down, eating together, all of which we learned very quickly was not something you wanted to do. Um, the first, the, almost within three weeks of the beginning of the pandemic, we had volunteers beginning to say, I don't feel comfortable coming in. So we knew that we were looking at a change in how we could serve. And then we also realized that we would put everybody who came in at risk because we weren't really sure at that point exactly how it spread and how, and, and how quickly it would spread among um, a population that didn't have access to clean water Robbie Douglas and Jerry Sumter, who are members of our staff, along with Terrence Goodwin, put their heads together and began to think about how can we really do this. They came up with a plan to, to serve not inside as we typically do, but to prepare to-go bags for people to take outside. We've had three regular volunteers from the congregation who've helped our three staff members. That would be Alan John Zupon, Tommy Beatenbaugh, and Lee Smith. And uh, we couldn't have done it without all of them working with our staff to, to make sure it happened. And we continually told the story of the soup cellar in different places and what our needs were. And thankfully, many people responded across the city uh, to submit donations to us. A lot of the volunteer churches continued to send their the monetary gifts and some of those who were no longer able to come and volunteer were able to send gifts from their Sunday school classes and I, you wouldn't believe we've gotten money for the soup cellar from just all across this city. And it's been rather uh, astounding. Prior to the pandemic we were in a mode of um, having a Sunday dinner event every two months. Um, we had a team of folks organized. We knew what we were doing every two months, like clockwork, we had it scheduled for either five or six times a year. And the pandemic certainly put a stop to that um, without us being able to um, meet indoors. Luckily, at the start of the pandemic, we received notification that we had received a grant from Richland County to help fund the Sunday dinner event. And with that, that funding in place, we were able to pivot and to switch the Sunday dinner event from being a in-building, in-house serving type fellowship to a outdoor mobile food truck type event. We have DHEC here to supply both first and second COVID vaccine shots and continues that ministry of serving the less fortunate and the ones going through um, home insecurities for really providing both food and access to those health services. You know, originally, the target date for coming back to in-person worship was July the 5th. And we had done significant amounts of work with our reopening team, um, which was established shortly after the pandemic began. We'd done significant work to make sure that we had the sanctuary set for social distancing, that we had plenty of sanitizer, that we had signage, that we had all the things that we needed in place to make sure people could safely gather. Well, then, as you recall, the numbers spiked significantly in late June, early July, and we immediately said, no, we're not coming back. We felt like it was too dangerous to come back. 
many churches in South Carolina started back to worship in July. Um, July and August are not the best times to be outside in South Carolina. So, so we decided uh, in early, late September, we started talking about should we come back to worship in, in October? And we felt like it might still be a little bit risky, so we decided that instead of coming back for in-person, we would begin our outdoor worship service. Safety has always been first for our congregation. That has been, you know, throughout all of this, we want to make sure that not only do we provide a safe environment, but that our congregation is comfortable with, with what we decide to do. Um, but but uh, the, the press, outside pressures, and, and Washington Street's been great, and has always been great in kind of, you know, walking to the beat of our own drum. And we continue to do that. We continue to make decisions for what's best for our congregation and our church. But those outside pressures, knowing that we are surrounded by people that may be much more aggressive from a reopening standpoint has been, a, has been an ongoing discussion. I would say that would be the biggest challenge that we faced. But we were trying to provide an opportunity for in-person worship at that point so that people could gather. We began to have some conversation at the council level about are we beginning to feel like the numbers are dropping enough for us to come back to in-person worship. And so we delayed that until May the 2nd. It was a hard decision to make to say, no, don't come back. And it, it, it was equally difficult for some people, I think, to feel really comfortable coming back. Over the last 18 months, we have had um, quite a number of staff changes. For the youth ministry position, we were very lucky and found Mackin Wall. Mackin grew up in Washington Street. Her parents go here, and she came available right at the time that we needed her, and she has served the church tremendously, um, made great relationships with the youth of the church, and has been great. In December, we received a resignation from our director of music, um, Dwight, and he got a great offer to go back to his hometown as a um, director of ministry at a church there. And great opportunity for him, but we immediately had to go into a search mode to find a replacement for him. Um, we were again very lucky, I think, and found a Nicholas Shoemate. Nicholas um, is a choral teacher lead at Chapin High School. He was um, serving as a music director at a local um, church here in Columbia and made a great transition right into supporting our um, choir and the music ministry that we have here, which is quite strong. In January, we received um, notification that our Reverend Parrish um, has decided to retire. She's been in ministry for many years, served at many churches, and we are so happy that she's able to retire and her and Gary really enjoy um, some time together. So the SPPRC um, started the process and worked with the district and um, the um, district and the bishop um, has appointed Reverend Becky Shirley to become the new minister of Washington Street. I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, and we attended um, College Place United Methodist Church and Asbury Memorial United Methodist Church and Virginia Wingard United Methodist Church and Trenum Road United Methodist Church growing up. My parents always chose a church close to where we lived, and so I've been Methodist all of my life. We um, went to um, various different schools in the Columbia area. I went to Columbia College for my undergraduate degree. Got a degree in political affairs, which is a combination of political science and history, and had planned to go to law school to be an attorney. I spent one semester in law school and realized that that was not my calling in life, and changed to the Master of Business School because my parents owned their own business, and so I thought, I'll just follow in the family tradition and, and do the family business. 
But by the time I graduated with my MBA, uh, my heart was pulling me towards caregiving ministries, helping ministries. And I took a job with United Way of the Midlands and did a lot of fundraising and community resource building, training of volunteers. And several years later, after I got married, my husband and I were about to adopt our daughter. She was almost five years old at the time. And my husband and I realized I could not work at United Way raising a daughter. The hours were just way too long. And so we came home from church, and in the church bulletin, there was an advertisement saying they were hiring a part-time volunteer coordinator at our church, Turnham Road United Methodist. My husband looked at that announcement, and he said, that's you. And so I went in and interviewed for the job, and I was hired in that part-time position. And our daughter, Michelle, started going to the preschool there at Turnham Road. And I served in that position um, from 1990 um, until probably 1994 when I started seminary. The senior pastor at that time was Reggie Thaxton, and he saw in me gifts for ministry and encouraged me to um, seek ordination. And so I started classes at Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary right here in Columbia. Went part-time to seminary while I continued to work at Trim Road. And I eventually became the associate pastor at Trim Road. And then in 2006, felt called to actually transition from being a deacon um, in that associate role to being a senior pastor as an elder. And the bishop appointed me to Johnston and Harmony Methodist Churches in Johnston, South Carolina. So I served that two-point charge for four years. And then the bishop called again and sent me to Platt Springs United Methodist Church in West Columbia. I served there for five years. And then I was appointed to Philadelphia United Methodist Church in Fort Mill. And stayed there for four years and then received the call this year to come here to Washington Street. When I received the call earlier this year that the bishop wanted to send me to Washington Street United Methodist Church, I was, I was pleased and honored to be sent to such a prestigious and uh, wonderful congregation. I've known a lot of the other senior pastors who've been here. They've been my good friends, and so I was very honored um, and I really appreciate the mission and the ministry of this congregation, uh, the openness of this congregation. But moving in the midst of the COVID pandemic um, seemed very difficult to me. Um, I loved the people at Philadelphia United Methodist Church and trying to say goodbye to people, trying to transition and get to know people in a new congregation, um, I knew it would be a challenge. I was grateful that the pandemic seemed to be coming to an end and so that at least worship was taking place in the building so that hopefully I would be able to meet people more easily than some of my colleagues did last year at the heart of the pandemic where they had to transition and all churches were worshiping remotely. And so I'm grateful for that as well. Um, but um, so I had mixed feelings, and I, and I think I always do when I transition because I, I love the people wherever God sends me. But I also have a lot of faith in the conference, in the bishop, in the cabinet, and I do believe that they go through these appointments prayerfully. And so, again, it, it was a great honor to think that um, they saw gifts in me that they felt met, met this congregation. I do know that... Um, for myself and for my husband, for our daughter um, and her husband, that we align very much with Washington Street United Methodist Church's um, involvement in the world. And I believe that it aligns very much with um, classic Wesleyan understanding of the social gospel and um, aligns very much with Jesus' call um, to love one another and to be um, understanding of one another and that we are all created in God's image and that every person is a value just because we are, um, not based on what we do or where we come from or what we look like, but just because. 
this pandemic has taught clergy and I believe congregations the wonder and beauty of adaptability. Obviously, the pandemic and this dealing with COVID-19 is a historic event. And, and despite all that we may put in place, or, or whether that be for, for our church, for our, our government, for our schools, for our community, I don't know how much we could have prepared for what we've had to deal with. One of the biggest challenges is going to be that everybody's thinking it'll be just like it was, and it won't. Um, it really won't ever be exactly the same because people have discovered new ways to worship, new ways to engage in worship, and I think we're going to be surprised that maybe we'll have more people who want to tune in on uh, a virtual service or on a live stream when we start live streaming again than we thought. And um, I'm not sure which one of those options we're gonna, gonna love in the future. One of the things I believe that this whole COVID pandemic has taught me is how important one-on-one -on -one personal relationships are in a congregation. And really being intentional about getting to know one another so that we don't just know each other by face and by name, but we really know each other. And so looking for ways that we can develop relationships, whether it is in person or whether it's through some of the wonderful technology that's just really taken off through the COVID pandemic, um, or creative ways that we can gather together outside, socially distanced, um, we've just got to really look at ways that we can connect with one another. Um, I'm very impressed by the number of adult Sunday school classes in this congregation. Sunday schools seem to be dying away in a lot of churches, but this congregation has a lot of active Sunday school classes, and I think that will go a long way in helping us to move forward through the pandemic and through any other difficulties that come around. The scriptures are full of passages, the one another passages, to encourage one another, to rejoice with one another, to weep with one another, to pray for one another. And that one another piece is so important to hold us together through the pandemic.